you very much for those kind words. I mean, he sounded fabulous, that guy you were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Daniel, still, I say, a second Daniel, as Shylock puts it. My, one, of my, one of my theories is that uh, Shakespeare has something to say about literally every situation, including having two Daniels. Um, I'd just like to begin by saying that uh, I, I'm very happy to talk about absolutely anything when we get on to uh, Q&A. So don't feel that you have to restrict your questions to the corpus. Uh, happy to talk about my <laughs> things, happy to talk about uh, my four authors, happy to talk about, about my own books. I'm feeling very mellow at the moment because uh, I, I flew in yesterday from Auckland, as, uh, as Sandra said, wow. and so I thought, well, a good way of uh, avoiding jet lag is to, is to just get out into some sunshine. And so I, I spent about two hours walking up and down on Venice Beach. And although I, I certainly got plenty of, of uh, retinal impression of light, I think I probably also just passively smoked about a joint and a half. <laughs> so, um, uh, again, uh, what is it that the, the, the great man says? To, to keep invention in a notian weed, son in 78. There is literally no situation that Shakespeare hasn't uh, addressed. And, and it was wonderful I think, to, to, to see Venice Beach. There were all these white haired elderly hippies still um, having not evidently changed their clothes since about 1968. And I was, a line came into my head, this is the aging of the dawn of Aquarius. You know, but, um, but how fantastic uh, in a state where so many things were closed down during the pandemic, uh, that the head shops and the other, uh, the other cannabis oriented uh, retailers were considered to be necessary shots uh, and, and were exempted. I have a, I have a friend here, who's, he's actually a, 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 a quite hard and successful money man, but he hides this behind a personality redolent of the Jeff Bridges character in The Big Lebowski. And during the lockdown, I, I was having a Zoom call with him and he said, oh man, I mean, who'd have thought the day would come when uh, I can just buy weed across the counter, but uh, I have to meet my barber down some back alley. So that's kind of what you're doing, uh, how fantastic it is. Uh, to be here, and thank you very much to Professor Lowenstein for this extraordinary uh, endeavor. It is so important because we're not just in the year, but in the month, the very month, uh, that is the 400th anniversary of what is surely the greatest act of literary salvage ever undertaken. Uh, without two actors, our language would be poorer, our imagination would be more limited, more restricted. Our very sense of ourselves would be cabined, cribbed, confined. It was November 1623 when two of Shakespeare's former uh, theatrical colleagues, uh, John Hemmings and Henry Condell, gathered together whatever material they could lay their hands on, copies of plays held by their troops, uh, notes made in the margins, uh, notes by the playwright himself, they tell us, uh, and one assumes their own recollections, and published it as the comprehensive record of Shakespeare's dramatic works. The name they gave it was Mr. William Shakespeare's Comedies, Histories, and Tragedies, published according to the true original copies, but of course the world knows it as the first folio. It contained 36 of the 38 plays, or 39 of you uh, are one of those who consider Edward III to be a, a, an authentic play. Now, half of them had already been published, and published in quarto form. In other words, written on bits of paper that had been folded and refolded to make these um, eight-page booklets. But a lot of those quartos had corrupted text. A lot of them were kind of crib sheets for actors. Uh, but 18 of the 36 plays in the first folio were published for the very first time. All's well that ends well. Antony and Cleopatra, As You Like It, The Comedy of Errors, Coriolanus, Cymbeline, Henry VI, Part I, Henry VIII, Julius Caesar, King John, Macbeth, Measure for Measure, The Taming of the Shrew, The Tempest, Timon of Athens, Twelfth Night, The Two Gentlemen of Verona, and The Winter's Tale. How can we compute what we would have lost without those 18 plays? Consider if nothing else, <clears throat> the phrases that have entered our language from those 18. Brave new world, love is blind, salad days, 
strange bedfellows at one fell swoop, faint-hearted, for goodness sake, rhyme nor reason, sea change, too much of a good thing, or consider the characters, unlimited archetypal characters we know better than our flesh and blood friends. No first folio, no scheming Lady Macbeth, mm -hmm. no Mooney Orsino, no vainglorious Brutus, and perhaps most painfully, no Cleopatra. One of the four characters in the corpus whom the great Shakespearean scholar A.C. Bradley considered inexhaustible. Excluding those who were at dinner with me before, who can guess who the other three were? <laughs> the four inexhaustible characters in Shakespeare's Cleopatra, Hamlet, yeah. Shiloh. Good guess, but no. No. Good guess again. Uh, so I'll give you a, the others come from Othello and from the Henry the Fourth plays. Falstaff. And Iago, exactly. Iago. Thank you. But I, you know, the, I, I want to I want to dilate briefly on the last unparalleled because she was the, if you like, the first the, the first it girl, the first the forerunner to every Kim Kardashian, every Paris Hilton, everyone whose fame was accomplishment enough, right? Who who's uh, who who were famous for being rather than for having done anything, yeah. or or more precisely, whose theatrical, whose histrionic depth served as their accomplishment. In fact, in a crowded field, I think she may have been Shakespeare's single greatest female character, nudging ahead even of Richard II, whom I've always considered to be a character who is written as female and, and should be played as feminine rather than as effeminate. Anyway, without the first folio, the last of the Ptolemaic dynasty would be only a historical figure. How much we would have we'd have lost the Cleopatra that feels so much more real than uh, the historical record. No, no squeaking Cleopatra would foil her greatness in the posture of a fall. Hemmings and Condor preserve our civilization as surely as those Irish monks in the Dark Ages copying out their uh, texts while the rest of Europe descended into horror at the very uttermost rim of the world. And their treasure today is scattered. Uh, there were perhaps 750 first folios printed at the time. We have 235 of them today, some in libraries, some in archives, some in private collections. It goes almost without saying that this great college is the owner of one of them, as are another 30 American universities, possessors of at least one copy, uh, including Harvard, Yale, Brown, Princeton, and Berkeley. By far the greatest trove is at the Folger Shakespeare Library on Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C. It has 82 of the extant copies, more than a third of all the surviving texts, and each one of those 235 copies contains the finest collection of words in this or in any other language. The first folio is the Torah of the English-speaking peoples. It's a text that is at once peculiar to us and universal in its application. Anyone sitting here tonight thinking, well, I'm Jewish and English speaking? Well, Mazel tov, you get two Torahs in it. <laughs> and just as Torah scrolls are treated with respect, and either encased or cloaked, and as I understand it, uh, housed in, in special cabinets, so those surviving 235 copies often carry the physical proof of the awe in which they were held by their subsequent owners. Greg Doran is the former artistic director of the Royal Shakespeare Company, and he spent this quarter centenary year visiting as many of the 235 copies as he can. Uh, he came recently to, to Parliament to do an event, and he told me that every one of the copies he'd seen had its own story that added something. One of them uh, had rings where people had been putting drinks on it. One of them had visibly the paw prints of a cat uh, there's one that is housed uh, in Philadelphia at Penn University, and it contains uh, the, the remains of a folio once owned by the great American actor Edwin Forrest, which burned in a fire at his home after he died. And the, the charred remains are kept 
in this case like some saint's relics. Every copy, like every person who watches the plays, adds its own experience to the drama, including the copy owned by the Royal Shakespeare Company itself, which was almost lost following a special performance in Rome in 1964. When the play was finished, this special RSC folio was offered to the then Pope Pius VI, uh, for, sorry, Paul VI, uh, for a blessing. And the pontiff smiled beatifically, thought it was a gift, and handed it to a waiting cardinal, and it required some very nifty diplomatic footwork uh, to avoid a major incident. It could have uh, disappeared forever into the vault of the Vatican. Uh, and every one of those copies, of course, is not only valuable, but valued. Uh, my, my, old, uh, my old college, Oriel Oxford, sold its copy to Sir Paul Getty for three and a half million pounds, which sounds really impressive until you learn that during the lockdown, Christie's auctioned a copy owned by Mills College in Oakland for $9.9 .9 million, which I think must make it the most expensive piece of literature ever sold just watched a council debate in Oakland, it occurred to me that they might have usefully carried on reading Shakespeare, it might have brought them a bit more balance and humanity, but I digress. Now, why do people, why do people spend those sums? Believe me, it is not for the quality of the original printing. Behind those grand leather covers added by the reverential Victorian enthusiasts, most first folios look cheap. They contain typesetting errors, they contain dodgy spelling, and they often contradict each other, sometimes in ways that materially alter the meaning of the drama. Uh, remarkably, no two copies are identical. Even the frontispiece, that, that, that copper plate image of a, a balding man with a bulbous head and a few wisps of, uh, of uh, a, a hair around his lips, the, the image, right, if I, if I say Shakespeare, the image that is coming into, into your mind, even that, when you look at it, is incredibly poorly executed. The head doesn't seem to connect with the shoulders at all. And yet, that engraving, so often the case of Shakespeare, that engraving by Martin Drewschut uh, is all we have to go on. It's the closest we get. Those, those mismatched eyes that seem to rest so diffidently on us and were drawn seven years after their subject had died is the closest we get to the greatest writer produced by our species. And it's about his greatness that I want to talk for the rest of this little presentation. We are so accustomed to Shakespeare's preeminence that we can lose sight of how bizarre it is. Some people refuse on principle to accept it. Listen, for example, to Sam Bankman Freed. A cryptocurrency billionaire who has recently uh, had some legal difficulties. Worth quoting what he said. Quote, when Shakespeare wrote, almost all Europeans were busy farming and very few people attended university. Few people were even literate, probably as low as 10 million people. By contrast, there are now upwards of a billion literate people in the Western sphere. What are the odds that the greatest writer would have been born in 1564. The Bayesian priors aren't very favorable. Bayesian priors, I should add for anyone who doesn't know, <coughs> roughly means your best statistical guess before you have gathered all of the data. Now, Bankman Fried thinks that we're basically conditioned to overvalue the authors who have become canonical. He thinks we are prone to uh, false nostalgia. And last month, the columnist Richard Henania, no relation, uh, Richard Henania expanded on Bankman Fried's argument. Because he said, quite apart from the Bayesian Friars point, uh, there's been what, what psychologists call the Flynn effect, which basically means IQs have risen. Right? So not only are we much more numerous than we, uh, much more numerous, sorry, than we were uh, in the 16th or early 17th century, especially those of us who are literate, uh, but we've got clever. And so what are the odds? Uh, now, and, and basically, Henenia's argument is uh, you, uh, we are all looking at the past with, uh, with a, an affected warmth. It's a variant, for those who are familiar with it, of the kind of uh, 
Johann Norberg, Stephen Pinker, Matt Ridley argument about uh, how things keep getting better and we all refuse to see it. And how life expectancy and peace and whatever are improving, but we're all subject to this, this false nostalgia. And Engels says, well, why shouldn't that also be true of literature? <coughs> well, one obvious point to make, uh, or at least one, one observation to make about uh, Sam Bankman Freed's argument is that you, you, you may regard the corpulent Californian as a brilliant entrepreneur, or you may regard him as a shyster, but either way, he cheerfully admits to having no time for books at all. Right? So, so in other words, he is dismissing Shakespeare uh, on the basis of a position of deliberate, uh, one might almost say exuberant, ignorance. When, by contrast, we look at the opinions of people who wrote for a living, people for whom words were livelihood, we see a kind of, we see them deferring in this kind of awestruck wonder to the man that Tom Stoppard once just called the champ, and, uh, and who, uh, and who P.G. Woodhouse, in what I, I always think is one of the most delicious lines in his entire glorious oeuvre, once described as my brother author William Shakespeare. You look at, you look at almost any, anyone who did this for a living, and they are at a loss to explain how Shakespeare was possible at all. Dr. Johnson wrote, we owe him everything. Uh, Jorge Luis Borges, the, the great Argentine writer, went so far as to compose a short story in which God acknowledges Shakespeare as an equal. He imagines Shakespeare dying and ascending to heaven and being greeted by his creator, who says, my dear Shakespeare, just as you did, I created worlds. Right? Now, okay, if, if, if God calls him God, we're talking about something rather out of the ordinary. Perhaps my favorite of these literary allusions to Shakespeare or, or records of, of his grandeur is, is from, uh, uh, from the novelist and, uh, uh, I guess, historian Robert Graves, who said, the really remarkable thing about Shakespeare is that he really is very good in spite of all the people who say he is very good. <laughs> and I think that's, that's the, the more I think about that, the truer it gets. So what is so special about him? Well, look, Shakespeare's genius assuredly did not rest in original plots. Uh, on the contrary, I've been trying to work this out. As far as I can tell, the only one of his plays from which, which was not based on, like, on a borrowed storyline was A Midsummer Night's Dream. And I, I, I may be wrong even about that, but all of the others are either taken from history or taken from somebody else's story or from something else. So look, it's not the storylines that are grabbing us in the belly 400 years. And more immediately, it's the language. It's that transcendent poetry that keeps coming inimitable and unsurpassable. And it's often the almost accidental passages that, 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 that choke you up, that the fragments of speech that are not part of any great set piece, but are kind of jotted down just to move the plot along. Okay. I was at Venice Beach today, so more or less at random consider the following passage from Richard II, the only one of the plays to have been written wholly in verse. So this is the Bishop of Carlisle talking, again, just moving along the plot, he's reporting the death of Thomas Mowbray, the, Earl of, uh, the Duke sorry, of Norfolk. Norfolk is a fairly minor character in the play. He gets, I think, 25 lines. This is, this is not part of anyone's set piece. I've seen productions, bizarrely, where these lines are trimmed or omitted altogether don't see how you could alter them without diminution. Many a time, a banished Norfolk fought for Jesus Christ in glorious Christian cause, streaming the ensign of the Christian cross against black pagans, Turks, and Saracens, he toiled with works of war, retired himself to Italy, and there, Venice, gave his body to that pleasant country pure soul unto his captain Christ under his colors he bore so long. <clears throat> Only once did I meet anyone who was excited, as excited about them uh, as I was. And, and this was um, a very brilliant man uh, called John Julius Norwich, a popular yeah. historian, actually the son of, of Duff Cooper, of Churchill's uh, uh, wartime information minister. And he, like me, had committed it to memory. Now, which of us wouldn't give our eye teeth to have written something like that? 
know, there is not a syllable of it that could be undone uh, or, or, you know, it could be improved, that could be changed uh, without altering the balance. And sometimes I find I get that effect even from the tiniest snatches of dialogue. Here, again, pretty much plucked at random from the air is how Perdita in The Winter's Tale hands a bunch of flowers, wild flowers, to Polixenet. Here's flowers. Hot lavender, mints, savory, marjoram, the marigold that goes to bed in the sun, and with him rises to weep. I can't be the only person who finds that I have a catch in my voice when I read. It's not part of any great set piece. It, it's, it's one of those lines that crops up all the time. And only when you pause do you realize that these incidental passages fill your mouth with words of power. They give you this, this sense of incantation. <coughs> and it keeps happening. It happens in every play. So uh, as Daniel mentioned on Saturday morning, I am doing a, uh, a seminar on Henry V. Now Henry V is famous for a couple of very big set piece speeches by the king, right? And because they're patriotic in English, most English people can quote them. But look at the forgotten snatches that nobody ever quotes and think of them just as little pieces of poetry. Unwind your bloody flag. <laughs> the, think of the, the flag of England, which is a, a red cross on it, as though you're unwinding it. It was spoken by the bishop at the beginning, foreseeing the full horror of what the war is nine words which I think are gorgeous, spoken by the, uh, the, the, the French commander in the morning. The sun that gild our armor, up my words. Who could, who could improve that by one syllable? And afterwards, towards the end, when Henry has just kissed his future wife, the French princess, you have witchcraft in your lips, Kate. All of these are lines that make you stumble, and if they're well delivered in the theater, they, they bring the concentration of the entire house to the scene. And yet, you don't find them in any dictionary of, of quotations, right? Because that is the normal stuff. That's what you're getting page after page. It's very hard to see how anyone could imitate it. But let's suppose that Richard Hanania is right, okay? Let's suppose that somebody could develop some kind of super intelligence that was capable of mimicking Shakespeare's linguistic style. It is not impossible. There is an AI program which has composed Bath to the point that experts can't tell the difference, right? So, so let's allow the possibility that something similar could happen. Even if that could be replicated, I don't believe that any digital genius could give us the inexhaustibility of Shakespeare's characters. Uh, sticking just because I was on the subject with Henry V for a moment, consider the protagonist, the eponymous hero of Henry V, right? the, the, the hero and the bully the extraordinary mixture of this ruthless, tough, and yet heroic uh, and patriotic king. Uh, as remorseless and undistinguished as some natural force, said W.B. Yeats in his essay about morality. A guy who, in his prayers, thinks it's quite okay to order God around and tell him what to do. Now, in every sense, that Henry V that comes in the pages of must be considered a more immediate and a more vivid and a more real character than the flesh and blood historical figure after whom he was named. And I think it's that reality, that immediacy, that Harold Bloom was getting at when he made his ambitious claim that Shakespeare invented human beings. In so far as we ourselves value and deplore our own personalities, he wrote, we are the heir of Falstaff and of Hamlet and of the other persons who throng Shakespeare's theater of what might be called the colors of the spirit. Bloom thought that Shakespeare gave us the tools and the vocabulary to explore our inner natures. That he anticipated psychoanalysis by centuries and considered the individual as an amalgam of emotions and experiences. And one consequence, which all of you who know the plays will recognize is the uncanny way in which the plays always seem to be on your level, speaking directly to you. In fact, the direction is so uh, direct, uh, the connection is so direct that the people who have 
identified their particular version of Shakespeare, think that he is their special soulmate, uh, can be thrown badly simply by being told that there are alternative readings available. Uh, earlier this month, on the actual day of the publication of the, or 100th anniversary of the publication, uh, I wrote a piece in the Daily Telegraph in the UK, in which I thought, I may, I think it's a fairly uh, bland point, which is that uh, uh, Shakespeare's fathomless uh, ambiguity meant that everyone saw something. Conservatives, so he's a conservative, to radicals, he's a radical, to cynics, he's a cynic. Uh, there's a leftist critic here called Clement of Rotter who uh, writes in a, a publication called Mayday, and he was so upset by my suggestion that even a conservative could find some value in Shakespeare that he responded last week like this Columns like these are designed to rile up people like me, and god damn it, digging up Shakespeare's corpse to sing praises wasn't the thing to do it. This vile scum of a man is a racist bigot. I, I, I think that means me, not Shakespeare. Uh, now, I can quite, I, I get, I totally get why somebody challenging your unidimensional idea of Shakespeare can be unsettling, jarring, right? And after all, the, the, Shakespeare these days is very often presented as a, a, an anti-racist radical. In fact, it, it's kind of de rigueur. Uh, every age sees its values reflected in the canon, and because our age is peculiarly obsessed with this question of race, it's doing the same thing. So London's Globe Theatre runs regular seminars on anti-racist uh, Shakespeare, which have recently included claims that Hamlet is wrestling with ideas of blackness and that King Lear is about kingship and whiteness. And earlier this year, when the Globe put on a production of A Midsummer Night's Dream, its website carried the following warning. Content guidance. The play contains language of violence sexual references, misogyny, and racism. Racism. I mean, you're, you're thinking, right, hang on, this is, this is the same play, right? It's the one about the fairies and the lovers in the woods, right? Yes, apparently racism, and not just that, but the racism begins, we are told, in the very first line. Can anyone tell me what the very first line of A Midsummer Night's Dream is? Now, fair Hippolyta, right? And on that basis, we need a trigger warning. But my point is not to, 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 to scorn or to mock. It's, it's to, to observe that everybody, everybody sees what they're looking for and sees it elevated and ennobled. While that Midsummer Night's Dream was running in Southwark, there was a publication on this side of the Atlantic, a collection of essays called White People in Shakespeare, uh, which made the startling claim that every single play was about race, and not just that, but that Shakespeare had invented white people, that white people had not existed as a category until the bard called them into existence. It's like a, a variant, if you like, of the, of the Harold Bloom argument. And, and by the way, I, I kind of get the point. It, 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 was, not, it, it was not written by, uh, by ignoramuses. They, 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 they loved the, uh, the corpus, and they dealt sensitively with the material. Their point was, again, this use of language about how you define the self happened in this context at the time. But you may be thinking, now hang on, which of the plays is about race? How can every single play be about race? You may be cudgeling your brain trying to think of what, how many non-white characters are you. Well, let me help you, right? There are three, as far as I can work out, there are three non-white characters uh, in the plays, not counting the Dark Lady from the sonnets. First, there is Aaron de Moore from Titus Andronicus, who is a cartoonish bad guy in a macabre pastiche of a play. Titus was very possibly Shakespeare's first um, first stab at drama. It seems a, an apt way of describing it in, in, in this occasion. It was, it, it was either his first or one of his first uh, plays. And it is, it took me a while to see this. It's an essentially comic work. It used to really bother critics. But how could the mind uh, that had come up with Hamlet and Lear have written this, this bizarre fancy? Well, the, the answer, if you've ever wondered that, as usual with Shakespeare, is to go and watch a good production. Uh, and I watched a fantastic production, again, at the Globe, where the, the director had seen <coughs> that Shakespeare had anticipated Quentin Tarantino by four <laughs> centuries because he'd realized that juxtaposing extreme violence, not with heroic lines, but with banal lines, is, is funny. I don't know why it's funny, but it is. It, it, it always makes the audience laugh. You know, I don't know, I didn't go to Burger King. It's, it's an intrinsically uh, comedic uh, 
juxtaposition. So, Aaron the Morph. Okay, bad guy, bad play. Shakespeare got better as he got older, which is reassuring, even for him. Then there's the, uh, the Prince of Morocco in The Merchant of Venice. Miss like me not for my compassion. He's a humane character, he's a likable, sympathetic character. In fact, I don't believe that any other European literature could have portrayed a Muslim as sympathetically as that at that time. And you might say, fair enough, right? Because uh, Catholic Europe had formed this league against Ottoman expansionism, uh, and uh, the Turks, the Saracens, were seen as the, the bad guys, the others, at that time. Uh, England did not join that league. England under Elizabeth had its own quarrel with Catholic Europe. And not only did it not join, it actually went so far as to appeal over the heads of its neighbors to the Muslim countries uh, for an alliance. Elizabeth I sent envoys to the Shah of Persia, to the Sultan of, uh, of the Ottomans, and most scandalously of all in the eyes of Europe, uh, English soldiers actually joined Moroccan soldiers in an attack on Spain, which was uh, uh, something that continental Europe took a long time to get over. But this, this like, relative um, uh, lack of the uh, anti-Islamic feeling that was, I suppose, understandable in some ways on the continent at the time, also makes possible Othello. It is difficult to see Othello, who of course is the third non-white character, difficult to see Othello uh, coming from any other culture. And I think actually very difficult not to warm to Othello. Uh, sure, he has his faults. Faults are the play. Uh, but even Iago, even Iago admits that the more, how be it, that I enjoy it, <coughs> is of a constant, loving, noble nature. So, two out of three non-white characters are sympathetically drawn. Now, there are admittedly several slighting references to Turks and Saracens, uh, including the ones that I quoted earlier from Richard II, but you don't infer Shakespeare's own opinions by keeping tally. Because the magic of the plays is that we find ourselves almost miraculously reflected in them. As Bloom put it again, you can bring absolutely anything to Shakespeare, and the plays will light it up far more than what you bring will illuminate the plays. Whenever we read Shakespeare's words, they seem narrowly aimed at us, amplifying whatever mood we're in. So quite naturally, People whose chief preoccupation is with imagined racial hierarchies will find them in Shakespeare, and not only that, but will find them more powerfully and more subtly drawn than anywhere else. Uh, it is, for example, at the moment almost a rigueur to play the Tempest as some kind of meditation on colonialism. Uh, there's, a, there's a line where uh, Prospero, talking of, of Caliban, says, this thing of darkness I acknowledge mine. To a certain kind of academic, you may even have one or two of them at UCLA, the only possible way to hear that line is as the condescension of the colonizer towards the colonized. But there are other interpretations available. Uh, there's a very left-wing playwright in Britain called David Hare, uh, and he wrote a sort of semi-autobiographical play about his time at a, an Anglo-Catholic boarding school in Sussex. And he includes what was obviously a true remembered episode where one of his teachers has just been watching this play. And he's a very religious teacher and he's moved beyond words by this line. This thing of darkness, I acknowledge mine. He says, it's the most Christian thing I have ever heard because he wasn't talking about Canada. He was talking about himself. Now, there you see, is that magic again. The same line can speak to people in different ways and we always feel that we're somehow privileged, we're somehow uniquely on his level. So in a way, all the, our own ages of sessions being reflected in the plays is no different from G.K. Chesterton being convinced that Shakespeare was an Orthodox Catholic, or uh, uh, Friedrich Schlegel being convinced that he was a German, kind of spiritual Teuton who had been accidentally born in the wrong place. Schlegel described him as, as uh, ganz unser, he's entirely ours. Um, Maya Angelou said, of course he was a black woman. I understand that, nobody else understands it, but I know that William Shakespeare was a black woman. She didn't believe that anyone could have written Sonnet 29 without knowing 
what it means to be a victim of racism and prejudice. When in disgrace with fortune and men's eyes, I all alone beweep my outcast state and trouble deaf heaven with my bootless cries and look upon myself and curse my fate, wishing me like to one more rich in hope. And of course she was right on one level, right? Just like Schlegel was right, just like Chesterton was right, Shakespeare kind of seems to know everything there is about everything, about being black, German, female, Catholic, Protestant, whatever. That, that is the weird sorcery intrinsic in the line. So to ask whether he's lived these things is pointless, bootless, as the man would say. Uh, as T.S. Eliot once put it, the most anyone can hope for is to be wrong about Shakespeare in a new way. And before we leave the subject of prejudice in the plays, given everything that's going on in the rest of the world at the moment, I would like to take a moment to touch on what I think is Shakespeare's most troubling work. I mentioned earlier in passing the pleasing manners of the Muslim prince in The Merchant of Venice. Let's just take a moment to contemplate its Jewish anti-hero. Twenty years ago, a British barrister called Anthony Julius, who was best known as the lawyer who defended the late Diana Princess of Wales, advanced the startling thesis that English anti-Semitism was more dangerous and more insidious than the continental variety. Right now, on one level, I think that is an extraordinary and preposterous thing to say, uh, as Paul Johnson showed fairly convincingly in his history of the Jews prior to the settlement of America, there was nowhere better to be Jewish. The country, uh, England, has had a very long philo-Semitic and Zionist tendency, starting about 30 years after Shakespeare died, uh, when Cromwell, who was inspired by this Old Testament heavy Puritan creed, uh, invited Jews to return. But Julius thought that the power of two great Jewish archetypes in English literature, Dickens's Fagin and Shakespeare's Shylock, gave Anglophone anti-Semitism a peculiar nastiness. Now, for what it's worth, I still think that's nonsense, because all he's really saying is that Shakespeare is a better writer than anyone else. However, if The Merchant of Venice were by any other author, it would no longer be performed. Because Shylock isn't a nasty piece of work who happens to be Jewish. Shylock is what the most vicious anti-Semite found in Jews have imagined Jews to be. Clever, legalistic, greedy, predatory towards his Christian neighbors. No wonder the play was so uh, warmly applauded throughout fascist Europe in the 1930s, constantly in demand. But worse than that, Shakespeare being Shakespeare makes Shylock plausible. Who today remembers Barabbas, the villain of Christopher Marlowe's play The Jew of Malta? Barabbas is a pantomime caricature. He's cartoonish. I walk abroad and knights and kill sick people groaning under walls, right? Nobody remembers a character like that. But Shylock is given just enough of a motive to make his malevolence understandable. We see him scorned, despised, and then we, we hear him justifying his vindictiveness with reference to the cruel treatment that we have seen the Christians meeting out to him earlier on. If you rob us, shall we not revenge? If we are like you in the rest, we will resemble you in that. Almost every Shylock I've ever watched, on stage or on screen, including the really great Shylocks, Dustin Hoffman, uh, F. Murray Abraham, uh, plus the Al Pacino screen push, almost all of them have softened the beyond what a fair reading of the text suggests, because modern audiences demand that gloss. And that's nowhere more true than of the trial scene, which strikes me as the most lethally anti-Semitic text since the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, or rather more than any other apart from possibly the Protocols, right? Because it's not one old moneylender who's on trial here, it's an entire religion. Shylock is repeatedly offered the chance to move from justice to mercy, to move from the Old Testament to the New, and he stands by the literal letter of the law, and so, as Christian anti-Semites of that era would have held, so condemns himself in the way that his people had condemned themselves by failing to demand the mercy for Jesus. So, I, I find the play difficult, and I find that scene almost unbearable to see. But, there is a British novelist and TV personality called Howard Jacobson who once upbraided me 
He said, you're being absurdly squeamish. You're missing the whole point. Shylock is the hero all the way through. Shakespeare intended Shylock to be the hero all the way through because he maintains his dignity in almost impossible circumstances. And there again, my friends, is that extraordinary magic. The way in which the same story can speak in utterly contradictory ways to different people or, indeed, to the same person at different times in their life or depending on what mood they're in. <laughs> so, Goethe, as a young man, when he was in his Sturm und Drang phase, he loved Shakespeare's plays for their vastness and their authenticity. He wrote that Shakespeare had created a huge animated fair that transcended the limitations of the theatrical forms that were then prevalent on the continent, which he thought had come from France and were, were restricted. Goethe went on to build a theatre in Weimar, which was in reality a temple uh, to Shakespeare. But by then, a curious thing had happened. Goethe still regarded Shakespeare as the foremost of all writers, but he'd now come to admire him for very different, in some ways, opposite reasons from before. Where he had once loved the plays for their spontaneity and naturalism and had seen them as an antidote to the stilted classicism of French theatre, he now came to see them as so so luminous that the very act of staging them marred their purity. There will be no laughing, he once told his audience. And by the end, having left behind, if you like, the sorrows of the young Goethe, he had concluded that the highest pleasure was simply to listen to Shakespeare's uh, line with closed eyes. So pure and perfect, you couldn't stage it, you could only listen to it as poetry. So, to ask again, how does it work? This endlessly dappled ambiguity. Keats called it Shakespeare's negative capability. And I'm not sure that anyone has ever fully explained it. But there's one thing we can say. Shakespeare was a flesh and blood author. A jobbing hack, we might almost call him. And like pretty much everyone who writes for a living, he honed his techniques over time. We know this because we can often see which sources he was using and how he adapted them in transcription. So for example, he based Antony and Cleopatra not directly on Plutarch's account, but on Thomas North's 1579 translation, because uh, although he could read Latin and Greek, he was quite lazy, and we know that whenever there was an English translation available, he used it. That is uh, one of the few things we definitively do know about him. Uh, now, it's worth just taking a moment, with one passage as an illustration, to, to look at the difference between North's prose and Shakespeare's verse. Because in these amendments, I think we get as close as we're ever going to get to seeing that extraordinary and ingenious mind at work. So, uh, let's take the passage, very famous passage, where Cleopatra arrives by river uh, to meet Antony. Here is North describing she disdained to set forward otherwise but to take her barge in the river Cygnus, the poop whereof, whereof was of gold, the sails of purple, and the oars of silver, which kept stroke in rowing after the sound of music of flutes, cowboys, scythons, viols, and such other instruments as they played up in the barge. Okay. That's, the, that's the original source. Now here's the swan of Asia. The barge she sat in like a burnished throne burned on the water. The poop was beaten gold, purple the sails and so perfumed that the winds were lovesick with them. The oars were silver, which to the tune of flutes kept stroke, and made the water which they beat to follow faster as amorous of their strokes. Now, there is absolutely no way that Shakespeare didn't have a copy of North open on the desk in front of him when he was writing that. Yeah, we can all agree with that. But look at what he did with it. Right? His techniques were so simple. He turns the prose into iambic pent pentameter, and then what does he do? He sprinkles in a little bit of alliteration. Like, so he likes the bee in barge, so he, he throws in a burnished throne that burned, and then he throws in a beaten, and then he takes poop, and he, he extends it to purple and perfume it, and so on. Now, when you look at it like that, it seems almost facile. Alliteration is the most basic of all literary devices. Any 10-year-old can do it. But read that passage aloud to yourself, 
then tell me who else is doing it. I think maybe some measure of Shakespeare's magic stems from the fact that we know so little about the man himself. It's not true that we know unusually little about him. We know about as much or as little about him as about any contemporary of his of that era. That is to say, we have the, uh, the main legal documents that mark the key events of his life. We have, you know, the, the baptismal records. We have the legal disputes, the will. Uh, but other than that, we have really only the plays themselves. <laughs> and that's the, that's the felicitous accident whose anniversary we are marking this month. Thanks to Hemings and Conkle, we have nearly a million words by the great man, but we have almost no words about him. And so we're able to infer what we will from the plays themselves without feeling that we need to interpose the author's own beliefs. What did Shakespeare believe? Was he Catholic or Protestant or atheist? Did he prefer the absolute monarchy depicted in his English histories or the republican virtue of his Roman plays? You know, we're surely past such a question somewhere. W. H. Auden makes this point very powerfully with reference to the sonnets. Though it seems to me rather silly to spend much time on conjectures which cannot be proved true or false, that is not my real objection to their evidence. What I really object to is their illusion that if they were successful, if the identity of the friend, the dark lady, the rival poet, etc., could be established beyond doubt, that this would in any way illuminate our understanding of the sonnets themselves. Quite. And by the same token, if some new evidence definitively proved that Shakespeare was Catholic or gay or one-legged or whatever, so what? The plays have created their own universe, a universe more intense in many ways than ours. What John Savage, the tortured hero of Huxley's Brave New World, calls that other world of truer than truth. Harold Bloom, after a lifetime of studying and teaching the plays, concluded only that Quote, by reading Shakespeare, I can gather that, apologies, he didn't like lawyers, preferred drinking to eating, and evidently lusted after both genders. To that list, I would tentatively add that he distrusted crowds, that he suffered a painful betrayal, and I know this sounds weird, but the only one I'm absolutely convinced of, that he hated hedgehogs. <laughs> I realize how bizarre that sounds, but it's the only conclusion that I draw with certainty. There are nine references to hedgehogs or urchins in his herb robustly hedge pig, whose wine begins the gruesome witches brew in Macbeth, and all nine are either monstrous, you spotted snakes with double tongue, thorny hedgehogs be not seen, or terrifying, hedgehogs which lie tumbling in my barefoot way and mount their pricks at my footfall, or insult. Dust grant me, hedgehog! <laughs> yep, there is no getting away from it. When the greatest mind of all wanted to convey something monstrous, it thought hedgehogs. <laughs> How are we to explain that weird kink? How are we to explain any aspect of Shakespeare? I close my talk uh, by leaving the answer to Hamlet. There are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than a dreamt of in your